Anyway, speaking of dumbing people out of position, one that we got a, a, a update on a previous drive through and this reminded me of something that I, le I left dangling with you, so to speak. Do you remember several weeks ago, we're both wrestling collectors and you got a thing and you told me about that thing right before we went on the air and when, when we started broadcasting, I was still wanting that thing and I was demanding that you give me, give me, give me that thing. And you didn't withheld that thing. You would not give me your thing. And indeed, that thing was has never been brought up by you again. That's right. And I still want that thing. But I have an email here that is what brought this to mind. <laughs> what is the email? Let's hear it's it. from Mandy. Mandy? If that, if that it, Mandy. What? I just said Mandy. She's a fine girl. No, that's Brandy. Well, Mandy, I'm sure, is a fine and lovely young lady who covers the ground she walks on and uses her left and right <laughs> turn indicators. But Mandy writes, my husband listens to all your podcasts and I like to listen in, but you left me with a huge cliffhanger and I'm dying to know, did Brian ever give you that thing? And if he didn't, why is he being so stingy with that thing? You can't really leave a girl hanging like this. She wanted to know... And now the secret is out that you are a stingy bastard with your thing and you have not given, 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 given me that thing. For those wondering what it is, through a connection I had, I was able to get Jim Barnett's chastity belt. No. <laughs> and now Jim won't leave me alone. He said, I need it. I need it. <laughs> but we'll see what happens. That's probably the last thing that was left over in the estate that Gary Jester kept for himself. Wait, what? Gary got stuff from the Jim Barnett estate? Gary Juster was, was the uh, attorney of some description. I'm not sure how many states he may have ever been licensed in that, that Handel was the, named the executor of, of Jim Barnett's estate because he lived in Atlanta and Barnett used to burden him in his latter years with various things. Did Gary, I mean, from you haven't talked to him in many years, but Barnett died years before that. Do you know, did Gary get any like old papers? Were there any old memos? No, 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 that nothing like that was ever even brought up. And he would have, I, th I th you know, it, it's like, it, obviously everybody knows that Jim Barnett live. I'm not trying to knock the dead here, Boy, I should choose my words carefully for the first time ever in history. Um, <laughs> he didn't exactly have as much money as he, as the style of life that he had led all those years led people to believe he had. And so at the end, it was more or less, you know, just a s small little thing and finding some people or whatever, as I recall, but not, no, he didn't like leave his goddamn 1956 indianapolis booking book or that would have come up and fucking as especially as goddamn money hungry as gary jester is he would have tried to sell me anything he had a jim barnett's you know there's a story it is an anecdote in uh ollie anderson's book that he did with scott teal uh crowbarpress.com free plug there yes where he says you know because only in 82 he purchases the 10 percent of georgia that bill watts had bill watts had had that since he had been the booker there in 73 he buys that 10% and then forms a union with Fred Ward and Ralph Freed. And the whole well, now, now, wait a minute, wait a minute, back up. When you say forms a union, it wasn't like amalgamated body slammers 14. He, he, he joins with, he has a, a, you know, he does business with, but they didn't form a wrestler's union. Right, right, right. right. Yes, That's yes. Bad choice. Well, for some of these younger listeners. So the whole goal was let's push Barnett out and let's take control of the office. And all he said in the book, yeah, because well, because Fred Ward and Ralph Freed, his son-in-law, and uh, um, oh gosh, what was it? Uh, Rose Ogle, who married Leon Ogle. Rose was Fred's sister, whatever. But they had had Columbus and Macon, Georgia, and TV there in each town, and the live events and spot shows around that part of Georgia for years, going back to the Gunkel days. So all of a sudden, when Barnett came in and and bought the big city, a guy came in to win the War of Atlanta. It wasn't like that Fred Ward, who'd been to Columbus, Georgia, a wrestling promoter since 1940, you know, fuck you, whatever, he picked to be partners with Barnett, and especially when Barnett's up there in the penthouse in, in Atlanta, and they're down running out of their garage in fucking Columbus. So I can see where, as Ole comes in, one of the boys that had even been in Georgia before Barnett came in, well, now we got Ole. <laughs> I'm almost doing this in Ole's voice. Now we got Fred and Ralph. 
and pretty soon the idiot will fall for it. And they were trying to take the state of Georgia. And so, yes. Well, a couple of things that Ole says is that he determined from going through the books, again, this is Ole's side of the story, Yes, that Jim Barnett was embezzling money, that he was taking money from the company and applying it to his personal lifestyle. I've spoken to people who worked in the office, like Bobby Simmons. They don't think that was true, but... Well, I, uh, Ronnie, Ronnie West's take on it, who worked in the office and refereed down there for so long, is that, well, he did take some money out every once in a while, but nobody offered to reimburse him when he put money in. Because Barnett would go and find money or get money or they'd, they'd, you know, hit a lick, as they say down south. And they'd make some money, stick some money back in. But he was, he, I can see where Barnett at that point would have thought, I can use this for my personal, you know, checkbook because I'm Jim fucking Barnett. And the story in the book is that Ole was talking to Vern Gagne. And Ole and Vern go way back. Vern trained Ole to be yeah. a wrestler when he was Rock Rogowski. And of course, anyone who's a collector who has old issues of wrestling as you like it, one of my favorite publications, knows that that's Jim Barnett had a column in there going back to the late, you know, 1949, I think was his first column, maybe. And he knew a lot of these guys from back then, like Vern, who was a major star in Chicago, which is where this publication came out of. And according to the book, Vern said to Ole, is Barnett still pretending he's a rich guy? Like, like <laughs> Vern had said that it had been an act the entire time. That it was really more, you know, Johnny Doyle who had the money, yeah, for, for many years, and and and, and uh, 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 not, uh, oh my God, I always get it mixed up with the Oates brothers. But Jim Barnett's partner, what was his first name? Oates, not Jerry and Ted Oates, but uh, I forget who it is too now. Yeah, but, but it, mixed up also, yeah, yeah, because of the famous Oates brothers. But anyway, he his partner Oates was the money backer for quite a while. Johnny Doyle, who was a big time wrestling promoter, but Barnett was able to get connections, put shit together, charm TV stations, you know, and, and make shit ha and insidious. And because he'd been around so long since the days when Vern had hair and was a national TV star, he knew everything. You know, but you hear from a lot of guys that say, oh, yeah, Barnett, you know, he had all the money. He was in the penthouse. And then, you know, you read this and it's like only. So, oh yeah, Vern said, oh yeah, he's been, it's, a, it's been an act for years. He never had money. It's yeah. always been an act. <laughs> so it really makes you wonder, like, what was and, 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 really and, going well, and, on? And think about that. But at the same time, think about what Barnett, when he was a dashing young man and, and his guy, which was his friend that he had in Lexington. But anyway, Rock they, Hudson. <laughs> well, no, not that. That's why I'm saying, but I think it was the Oates guy was his friend in Lexington. They were, they lived, they they worked out of the Indianapolis territory. That was the base, which that at the time in the fifties was Indianapolis, Detroit, uh, even uh, Chicago back at that time, uh, down to Louisville, et cetera. It was huge territory. But even though that was the seat of it was Indianapolis, Barnett and his partner uh, lived in Lexington, Kentucky, <clears throat> because it was a not too far drive away, but there was the University of Kentucky. And there's the football team, and they wrote the book about it, The Thin 30. I forget the fucking author's name, but if you look it up, The Thin 30 is a book on the 1962-63 University of Kentucky football team. And the coach was so draconian and such a slave driver. That's why they called him The Thin 30, because he ran most of the players off the fucking team with the practices and beat the other ones down physically. And to make extra money, they were attending the parties and becoming party favors for Jim Barnett and God damn, what was his name? The first name Oates anyway, uh, who at the time lived and had a penthouse in one of the buildings in downtown Lexington, which imagine back then, I think it was 50,000 people in a town, but they're driving down main street in a huge late model fucking convertible Cadillac and these suits they were still fairly young guys. You know, they've got all this money that they're spreading around. And so they're paying the fucking football players to come to their penthouse parties and perform deeds of various descriptions. And when Rock Hudson filmed the movie Rain Tree County with Elizabeth Taylor, I think it was, they filmed in one of the rural counties down below, down south of Lexington, and that's where he met fucking Jim Barnett. And because Rock Hudson, in even then in Los Angeles, you know, I mean, besides the fact he's a worldwide fucking movie star, obviously, but there's no internet, there's no fucking Twitter back in the good old days. 
so he can't fuck around in Los Angeles, but he can come out to fucking Lexington and go to these fucking penthouse parties with the UK football players. Hence why Rock Hudson was spending a lot of time in Lexington in the early 60s. But when publicity got out about the football player situation, et cetera, even though nobody was underage, it was fucking college, for heaven's sake. <clears throat> but that's one of the reasons why Barnett decided he had this, he had met this sponsor, had the opening. There was some talk going around town in Lexington, and he m moved to Australia and opened up the world's biggest wrestling promotion at the time. And that's when he sold Detroit to the Sheik, and Bruiser and Snyder were already running opposition. They had just broken off in Indianapolis, and he negotiated some deal, apparently, which they promptly then, once he was in Australia, never paid him anything <laughs> on. <laughs> and there you go. And and there's Barnett's in Australia for the next eight years till they need him in Atlanta to win the war. See, there's the most complicated wrestling biography to write, the Jim Barnett story. Oh, Just because there's so much myth, no one knows the true origins of the man. And, you know, you go back and you read these old wrestling as you like it columns and you realize you'd have to have all these columns together to be able to put together at least some semblance of what his life was like between 1949 and 1953. And then it's just, just large gaps where we don't know the true story. And, you know, there's so many different stories about him. And that Well, the th thing about this, if it hadn't been for him, he's the one, when he was in Indianapolis, he was making so much money that he didn't need to or want to expand to the West Coast. But... He found that he got in contact with the or found the sponsor some kind of way that would put wrestling on in San Francisco on television for the first time. And because the old time promoter, Joe Mankiewicz, right? Yeah. He didn't want television. He was still from the 30s and it's like, ah, you know, <clears throat> I'll just run my business. So Roy Shire was one of Barnett's top heels, along with Ray Stevens, the Shire brothers, Roy and Ray. And so he knew that Roy Shire would be a good booker, so he sent him out to San Francisco and set him up with the sponsor. And he got television and became because you couldn't wrestle and become and be a promoter at the same time in California in those days, the Athletic Commission. Roy Shire retired, opened up the office, probably sent Barnett a piece of it or points or whatever. <clears throat> and he brought Ray Stevens out as his top heel, and San Francisco became the biggest wrestling market in North America for, what, two years at that point. Was Stevens and supposed to be a partner in the office? Stevens was a, from his own lips. The deal was that, well, Ray, you know, my his brother was talking to him, his brother Roy, right? Ray, you know, you can't wrestle and be a promoter, so you'd be the... And, and it's not like he wasn't paying him. Ray told me, and I mean, there is, there's wrestler's exaggeration, but this is believable because of the fucking situation. He said he was making hundred and fifty grand a year in 1963, living in San Francisco on the beach with a car, a boat, and a motorcycle. And, you know, and wrestling four or five times a week because it wasn't even a giant territory. <clears throat> but because he was so important to San Francisco, you know, he's the biggest box office attraction of that year or whatever. Anyway, but he said, yes, he said that was the whole deal is that he'd be figured in at, you know, at some point at the end or whatever. And it was one of those, wouldn't you know who won the pony deals that it didn't happen. Sort of, it eventually happened with Lawler, but it happened six years after Jarrett said it could both because Jared never offered and Lawler never asked. That story is always funny to me. The idea that Lawler thought he was going to be the partner and it never happened. And Jerry said, well, you know, I just forgot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you were supposed to be my partner. <laughs> but anyway, but yes, Barnett going back to, but yes, Ray Stevens told me that, that specifically that, uh, that you know, that, that was the whole thing. Barnett was so powerful and had so many contacts in, in and around wrestling or people that could help wrestling that he could he could just make you a fucking millionaire by just setting you up with something that he didn't have time for. I mean, you know, he was there at the beginning of TV, and he was one of the first guys, if not the first guy, to figure out how to leverage that TV into building those relationships. You know, Fred Kohler didn't successfully do it. <laughs> After a while, that ran out. It was Barnett. He's the one who really arose out of that office, and 
walked away with all the ideas and and all the contacts. Yeah, because the Fred Kohler, the same guy that was the biggest, most successful wrestling promoter in the world in like 1954, was fucking using Jack Pfeffer's fucking phony guys eight years later, and you know. Barnett owns half the fucking Midwest. You know, that's not even what amazes me the most. I, I got a good collection of these Wrestling Life magazines, which is what Wrestling As You Like It became once it went to monthly. And then it changed different sizes, different formats. And by the time Bob Luce got it, it went insane. Yeah. <laughs> but you look at the ones from 60, 61, 62. And obviously he has Buddy Rogers. He has Bearcat Wright. He has some big attractions there. But it seems like the territory is still doing great. So, I mean, you talk about whatever, 55, 56 to when Jack Pfeffer came in. Yeah, I mean, you could see how over that many years something would happen, but it's just a couple of years before Pfeffer comes in where the territory's still thriving, even though they're not on national TV. Yeah, something happened there, and uh, possibly you can do a podcast about it, and a, a 64-part in-depth series. On 1960s Fred Kohler? Yes, I think you should. I think you should become Fred Kohler's fucking... Major bog of getting back in the wrestling hall of or getting in the wrestling hall of fame because, for heaven's sake, what happened with Fred Kohler? Was it outside influences? We'll never know. We'll never know. Every time I see a Kohler sink or toilet, I think of him. Yeah, every time I sit down and take a shit, I think of Fred Kohler, and then I <laughs> stand up and wipe my promoter. That's I mean, that's an old Dennis Condry. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna go take a Booker, and then don't forget to wipe your promoter. You know, whatever. Anyway, because the, the office was always against the boys. That was that that thing. 